Hey, welcome back to another episode of Right Machining and Casting. In this episode, I'm going to take you through the process I took to make this casting. This casting was inspired by Princess Otto when they decided to send me a tooth. I figured, hey, how can I give back to Princess Otto and show my thanks? And what a better way to showcase my work and say thank you at the same time for this week too. Like all my projects, they start out in the shop. The first step in the whole process was to grab some pink foam and cut the sign out with the CNC router. Now, since I'm going to be filling this with two-part epoxy, it's really just a matter of taking away the parts that I want to put two-part epoxy in. And since we're doing lost foam casting, I don't have to put any relief on it. Today with this casting, I'm trying something just a little bit different. Some of the gentlemen from the lost foam casting community on YouTube have suggested to thin down my solution of drywall mix. And on this casting, it not only gave me a better surface finish, but it gave me a faster drying time as well, and better results. One of the other suggestions that was given to me by Steve Zurate was to use the air hose after the application of plaster to get rid of some of the air bubbles. And, although I didn't use an air hose, gently blowing on it seemed to do the trick as well, and I got very minimal air bubbles in this casting. Also in this casting, I learned something else as well. This casting is quite long and could be susceptible to bending when I put sand over top of it. And in the later video, you might see a little bit of warpage due to packing the sand around it. In the future, I might create ribs in the back just to hold it together a little bit better so it doesn't bend. Now some of you might be new to the lost foam casting process. This process is pretty simple. You're basically going to take your part and put it in a pail of sand and vibrate sand around it to pack it down. In other videos, you'll see me use a recip saw to vibrate the sand down. But I got my hands on a concrete vibrator, and I was hoping that it would work a little bit better, and it seems to work a little bit better, almost too good in some places. Also, now would be a good time for the disclaimer. Casting and working with machinery can be a dangerous game. One small mistake can wind up with disastrous results. So minimize your risk by doing lots of research to minimize your risk. As you see the vibration of the sand, you'll see the sand slowly going down and becoming a harder solution, almost like concrete, but not quite. This has got to be killing Kelly right now, one of the lost foam casting gurus, who suggested that I had to filter the sand while I'm doing the pour out of the casting. And he's absolutely right. In the end result of this casting, some of the chunks that were left in the sand pressed on the face of my casting and left little divots. I guess I'll have to head out to Princess Auto after I'm done here and pick up some screening and build a filter. Now for this casting, the pail didn't quite fit the part that I had to cast, so I had to kind of come up with this little system. If you look down there on the bottom of the screen, you can actually see the foam sticking out. And this will need to be covered so I don't have a blowout and have to cut out the aluminum later. Let's fire up the foundry and get things rolling. After about 20 or 30 minutes of heating, you might notice some of the aluminum that's on top of the furnace, and I'm preheating it to keep moisture out of everything. You might recognize these from the previous episode. These are from the previous episode where I built some keychains, and I'm in the pursuit of building belt buckles out of brass. Check out those videos for more. Now, some of the more astute people might have noticed what just happened there. This at minimum could cause a spitting of aluminum or at worst, an explosion of the aluminum, sending a molten aluminum everywhere, and that's not going to be a good day for anyone. Now I'm just going to preheat it on the top of the oven, and then I'm going to put it in a warm place, and keep it there until I need it the next time. Generally the aluminum that I start with, other than recycling some of my old projects, is cast aluminum, which I found in, say, like pistons or industrial parts. But we have to make sure it's nothing like magnesium, which would be a large problem for my casting process. Melting all this aluminum winds up with giving me a lot of dross on the top, which is the waste part that I'm not going to use. This is simply skimmed off and put off to the side. Also, a metal crucible isn't best practice, as it can leave impurities or fail. Now for the critical moment. The cup has to become full, and then stay full, because if the cup becomes empty at any point, the sand will collapse around the part, leading to a failed casting. The remaining aluminum will be poured into ingots and reused again later. 
Now, I'll take the time to demonstrate a small hazard. You probably noticed aluminum plates to the right of your screen. I intentionally put these there to protect my legs from getting caught by molten aluminum. Now I tilt the bucket back to simulate a blowout and it shot out about two feet, safely landing on the ground far away from me in some sand. Now for my absolute most favorite part of the whole process. That's right, finding out whether it's a win or a fail. Now would be a good time to say hey, if you like this video, click that subscribe button. We've got quite a few more episodes coming out that are similar to this one here, and I know you're going to enjoy them. Now remember that plaster a little while ago we were putting on? This is what I'm rinsing off now, and this plaster gave me an impeccable surface finish. Let's take this out to the wood shop and clean up the screws. Then, we're going to go on to the process of felting it. This is the same process that you might have seen me do in the drill bit holder. Basically what we're going to do is take a 3M two-part spray, spray one side, and then stick the felt to the other side. Then I'm going to grab the sharpest razor I possibly can find, and I'm going to slowly cut around the outside of it after I cut the bulk of it out. In the casting, you've got to take a lot of care to make sure that you get all the flashing off, or you're going to have problems in this process. Now I know what you're thinking, I'm going way overboard by felting the back of this. But I think it just adds a touch of class that can't be beat. Let's flip it over and try the two-part epoxy on it. This is polyurethane two-part epoxy that I got at my local craft place. I got a little bit showy here and didn't quite make the mixture perfectly 50-50 and I had to go back and refer to these marks. Now I'm just going to add a bit of blue pigment and then slowly fold in the epoxy. With a 10 mil syringe, I'm just going to draw in the epoxy. Now I've got a long work time with this epoxy, so there's no rush to go through the whole process. Although I do wish it set up a little bit faster, because of a slight bow I couldn't quite get the casting even. This caused the epoxy to flow gently to one side and I had to keep playing with it to keep the epoxy level. After filling all of the crooks and crannies, I then had to go over it slightly with a piece of paper towel just to clean it up a little bit. Now let's let her dry, then we'll take her out to the shop and hang her in the place of honor above the mill machine. Hey, I'm also doing a sticker giveaway. Email me while supplies last at rightmachiningyahoo.com and I'll fire you out some stickers while the supplies last, of course. Catch you next time.